Hello and welcome. To what extent is Pakistan becoming the new epicenter of religious extremism and what can be done to reverse that trend? The White House says the failed bombing in Times Square on May the 1st was the work of the Pakistani Taliban. The authorities arrested 30-year-old Faisal Shahzad, who allegedly confessed that he was trained in bomb-making during a five-month trip to northwestern Pakistan. In March, five men from the U.S. state of Virginia were detained in Pakistan. Officials there say they were planning to fight American forces in Afghanistan. And recently, India sentenced Pakistani citizen Ajmal Kassab to death for the Mumbai attacks in November of 2008. Well, Pakistan's government has conceded that part of those attacks were planned on its soil. Observers also say that a majority of those involved in bombings and plots in the U.K. are of Pakistani extraction or have some connection to that country. So today we ask, what impact will a focus on Pakistan have in the fight against religious extremism? Remember, you can join our conversation with your questions and comments, send an SMS or an email, and we also welcome your phone calls on the show. I'm joined now from Karachi by a columnist and former Pakistani officer, Ikram Segal, who also runs Pakistan's largest private security firm. In Lahore, we have Pakistani-American sociologist and author Aisha Dalal. She's also a professor of history at Tufts University in the United States. Her latest book, Partisans of Allah, Jihad in South Asia. And joining us here in Washington, D.C. is Christine Fair, who's the assistant professor of peace and security studies program at Georgetown University. I welcome you all to the show. Thank you. Major uh, Sigal, if I could start with you, sir, there in, uh, in Karachi. Um, in, in reality, how desperate is the, the security situation in Pakistan? Is it, is it uh, as bad as the media says, or is it largely a, a, a certain amount of hype and hysteria? No, I think uh, the, if you want to call it desperation measures, I think the desperation is on uh, the side of the terrorists, because uh, the Pakistan army has done a fairly successful counterinsurgency operation in Swat first, and then South Waziristan, and driven most of uh, these uh, Taliban, uh, Pakistani Taliban, into uh, which were allied with Al Qaeda, into North Waziristan and Orukzai Agency, and there's a quite a uh, battle going on in Orukzai Agency at the moment, and you have a lot of Chechens and Arabs there. I think basically what uh, is happening is that they are reaching out uh, to uh, establish their credibility in the sense that they are not finished as yet, and why not? Because the fact of the matter remains that uh, during this process, the last 20 years, they've had time to build up infrastructures on the ground, they have logistics, mm -hmm. they have a fair amount of uh, molds uh, planted all over the place, and uh, obviously, uh, uh, at the moment, all, all this hype that you see is basically based on the fact that they want to, uh, you know, m make their presence felt, that they're not finished as yet. Mm -hmm. I so I think if the desperation measure is there, right. it is on part of the, uh, part of the uh, m m terrorist. But I must uh, caution one thing. We have a very successful counterinsurgency program. We have nothing as far as counterterrorism is concerned. On the ground, what we really need is a counterterrorism force. And that, uh, I'm sorry to say, the Pakistan government has not addressed itself. And the Pakistan army is not um, about to get involved right. into uh, uh, battles in the urban areas, the rural areas, or Major, the settled areas. Yeah, a quick thought, sir. A quick thought. Just if, if there has been that much success, why such uh, a feeling in Washington, D.C. that there has been uh, largely a failure or a, certainly a weakness on the part of Pakistan's uh, government and military in, in handling the situation? Well, I think uh, what has happened is that, you know, um, obviously Faisal Shahzad uh, created quite a, uh, you know, spectacular event by going into Times Square and obviously, on the other hand, uh, let's be very uh, uh, fair about it. If he has had five months of training and he could not rig up a car bomb, I think that shows that he was probably not trained by the right people. Right. And that has been pointed out by experts in Washington and New York and okay. other places. I'm going to the fact of the matter remains that uh, mm -hmm. I think there is a sort of a mantra in uh, Washington, which is that, you know, the moment something happens, you know, uh, press down on Pakistan, there is a requirement uh, for going into North Waziristan. I don't think the Pakistan army is ready to do that as yet. It's not because of their intention. It is because of the capability. They've had a long fight. Okay. Uh, they've lost uh, more men. Uh, in fact, if you look at the casualty figures, uh, they've lost in one month 
what all the Iwan National Army, Iwan police have lost in 12 months. Major, I'm going to so stop you. Is, uh, I'm going to stop you there for just for a second, sir. Statistics yeah. alone. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I'm just going to stop you for a second because I want to bring in the other guests, and I'll get back to you very shortly. I apologise for the interruption, but Christine Fair, this issue of Washington D.C. and, and the sense the major gives of what's happening in D.C. The U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has had some fairly harsh words for Islamabad, saying that there would be severe consequences for Pakistan if attacks such as that one in Times Square uh, were to be successful. Now, what kind of pressure is that putting on the Pakistani government, and is it fair? Well, actually, in this case, I really don't think it's fair. The United States has been really insouciant about our own domestic challenges. So for so many years, we've seen citizens, as you noted, of Pakistani origin, but essentially British citizens radicalizing in the UK. Now, admittedly, they're going to Pakistan for training, and then they're returning with capabilities to affect actions, but they essentially radicalized at home. And I remember when Tony Blair went to Musharraf, with a very similar message, Mashara said, listen, they're radicalizing in your country. So I think the United States really needs to embrace what appears to be a reality. There have been now far more episodes than one wants to recount of American Muslims, either born or naturalized, going through a similar path and also converts radicalizing here and seeking training. So this is clearly, this is going to require a multiple part solution, understanding why folks are radicalizing here, but then also working with the Pakistanis to eliminate those places where individuals are training. Ashish Jalal, if I could bring you in here and, and ask, isn't it ironic that the Taliban uh, is an organization that, uh, the, that Pakistan supported and funded in Afghanistan and, and now essentially has turned off into, in, it developed into an offshoot and turned against its one-time benefactor? Well, I think the Taliban you're speaking about are uh, the Pakistan Taliban who have been, uh, who've been an offshoot of the Afghan Taliban that the Pakistan army supported. Uh, and uh, we know from analysts and we know from the evidence that uh, Pakistan uh, has been looking kindly upon the Afghan Taliban, certainly segments of them, uh, but regards the tehreek -e taliban which is an offshoot, um, as a threat and is uh, conducting uh, military operations uh, that uh, Major uh, Ikram Segal just mentioned to you. Uh, I, uh, so I don't uh, find the irony ac at all, actually. Well, I was saying, uh, the other thing, uh, Ajay, is perhaps that uh, there's also the issue that uh, Pakistan has come under the spotlight and, and the sense that it seems to shuttle between Afghanistan and Pakistan, and now it's Pakistan's turn. I wonder how people in Pakistan regard this focus on the country and, and what seems to be a, a general labeling of the country. Now, to be Pakistani is, is considered a negative thing, certainly in American eyes. Well, frankly, Riz, I mean, I think that this is not new. This has been happening for a long, long time. And so when you speak about the new epicenter, I thought Pakistan was the epicenter. Uh, so, well, there's more of this but because of Faisal Shahzad's uh, uh, botched up uh, uh, bombing attempt. Uh, but the fact remains that Pakistani's reaction is that they're once again being, um, being sort of uh, uh, being lambasted by the American media. Uh, and I think the, the, the sense is that there is a, uh, uh, this, is, you know, this is a product of some sloppy analysis uh, because you can't seem to decouple uh, an individual act with that of the whole uh, right. nation of Pakistan or for that matter the fact that there is, uh, there is clear difference of opinion uh, between the United States it would seem and the Pakistani uh, uh, military establishment on how to proceed with certain uh, 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 elements of the Taliban, particularly the northern, the, 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 in, in North Waziristan. Okay. And I think that the Pakistanis are just sitting back and wondering why they are getting sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, painted by this, by, by, you know, tarred by this brush. So I think there is a sense of, res sense of resentment. I think in terms of American foreign policy, and I completely agree with Christian, Christian that, that it's totally counterproductive uh, to continue to sort of look for these simplistic explanations we are really now okay. uh, ready and we, we have enough evidence to take on a more mature and a sophisticated uh, explanation of what's going on. Le well, let me bring in a caller. Fozan has been waiting very patiently in, uh, in Saudi Arabia to ask a question. Thank you for that. And go ahead, please. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. No, no, nice, nice thing to your ears. Go ahead. Okay. And, uh, it, it's, it's, it's the irony that there have been many Faisal Shahzad 30 years before. Okay? And those Faisal Shahzad were Mujahid, were called Mujahideen, were called what not, okay? If those people were doing this type of same things in Russia, in Russia or in Afghanistan, they were called as heroes. So just that is happening in America and that's happening in Pakistan now, so it has become a sin? No, okay. it's not the case. 
Okay, it's, uh, Major uh, Major Ekram Sigal, if I could just get you in here and ask about this, the point that uh, we're getting from our caller is that that this is something that's not new, but the labeling of it and the, the sort of perspective on it has been given a very strong American spin, and perhaps that's given it a, a different kind of stress now. You see, uh, is unfortunately, what happens is that uh, uh, cases of Faisal Shahzad are blown out uh, of proportion. I don't say from the media side. But they are blown out of production. Now, I'm so, you mentioned that I own the largest private security company in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. About a month ago, uh, five of my boys who were holding the line in the American Consulate General outside, they were uh, uh, attacked because the American Consulate General in Peshawar was attacked by two cars of suicide bombers, six of them. They overran the FC check post, and uh, our, my boys, all five of them got wounded, held the line. And if they had not held the line, the uh, uh, bombers would have been with ramps. They had come armed with ramps. They would have been over the wall. Uh, the American um, uh, embassy and everybody up the line, up to the State Department, was very, uh, were very grateful for that. And they said that they would have lost American lives. Now, what do I go to those five boys of mine who got wounded, two of them very seriously? In fact, they were taken for dead away from that place and tell them that you boys are now the epicenter of terrorism. Right. You see? Now, the point is that here is, th these boys are dying for you. These boys are dying for you. More people have died in uh, South Pakistan and in, uh, uh, in uh, Swat than have died in the entire, uh, by the entire Afghan army and the entire Afghan police in the whole year. Right. So, right? Major, yeah, the in point... The, I would the say in the whole uh, last three, four years. Yeah, the point being that it's uh, America is as much a target as well. Uh, I mean, sorry, no, so uh, Pakistan is much a target as well uh, in, in there. And it's, it's, mis you know, it's a misrepresentation Absolutely. of and, Pakistani and, and, people. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm just going to, because um, I have to take a break and, in a second. Let me get in. I was, I was, I'm very grateful to Aisha. Jalal. Go ahead, sir. I, w I just want to uh, just comment on, you know, I'm very grateful to Aisha Jalal and Christine Fair for rightly pointing out that this Faisal Shahzad, yes, I agree with you, he was trained in Pakistan, but he is a disgruntled element of the American system. Right, okay. The guy lost his, uh, you know, his mortgage, his, this thing, he lost his house, and th he showed no signs till two years ago okay. when things started unraveling for him in the American system. Let me get a caller so in here. There's something happening there yeah. that was this thing. He, he, I understand, he, sir. Let me, let me his, get in. Let me his get radicalization a, of his mind started in the United States. Ebere in Ghana has been waiting as well. Ebere, go ahead, please. Hello. Hi, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, hurry. My question is, why is that all attacks by the Pakistan Taliban outside the shores of Pakistan is always politicized, whereas there are several attacks of this nature inside Pakistan and also in those other countries, people get attacked. Those countries get attacked right. by people from other nationalities. Why is Pakistan... Right. Um, government. Iba Ibele, that's, a, that's a very valid point. I'm going to put that to our guests. We're going to take a very short break here and we'll get to that interesting point made by our caller there when we return. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Is Pakistan turning into a haven for Islamic extremism? Recent events linking that country to a number of attacks and plots suggest that religious groups are recruiting and training young men with increasing frequency. What can be done to reverse this trend? Discussing those issues with me, a retired Pakistani army officer, Major Ikram Segal, who fought against India in the 97, uh, 1971 war and escaped after being taken prisoner of war. He now runs one of Pakistan's largest private security firms. He's joining us from Karachi. From Lahore, we have Aisha Jalal, who's a professor of history at Tufts University in the USA. And here in Washington, D.C., is Christine Fair, assistant professor at Georgetown University. Her research focuses on political and military affairs in South Asia. And it's Christine Fair, I want to turn to you with that question from our caller, Evere Ngana, who said, basically, why is it when an attack by a Pakistani is outside the Pakistani uh, boundaries, with outside Pakistan itself, it's politicized, but not much mention is made of what's happening to Pakistan itself in terms of being attacked and being targeted. And of course, when it's uh, a non-Pakistani elsewhere, it doesn't get the same kind of weighting. Well, the latter one's somewhat easy to deal with. It's just a question of frequency. If we were to take a look at the majority of attacks happening outside of Pakistan, we're seeing Pakistan emerge quite frequently as a place for training. But I want to go back to, uh, to some sense, what we're really seeing is that folks are radicalizing not in Pakistan. They're radicalizing elsewhere. And this suggests that we have to have a multi-focus solution. It's true that condition upon radicalizing, there's only really one place where you can go for training in Pakistan and, and, and possibly increasingly with Yemen. 
But this does suggest that Pakistan's a problem in the sense that training camps are available. Mm -hmm. Going back to your point, what, what is interesting is that Pakistan has long been a place where militant organizations have received training and backing, be it in Afghanistan, be it in India, in Kashmir, and they've been largely localized to those theaters. But what we've seen increasingly since 2004 is that Pakistan is experiencing this backlash. I see the big challenge for Pakistan is that it's very difficult going forward that Pakistan can say Jaish al-Mohammed protects our interests, but the, te the Tariqe Taliban in Pakistan does not, mm -hmm. when the TTP draws its manpower from Jaish al-Mohammed. So the challenge for Pakistan is really going to be how do we get away from seeing militancy as a tool in any strategic right. sense. Until they do that, it's going to be difficult for them to deal with the TTP. Well, Aisha Jalal, I want to put an email to you, if I may. It came in from Shahid Ali in Pakistan. He says, Afghanistan is the real epicenter of extremism. Pakistan is only involved because of its open border to Afghanistan. And since the U.S. and NATO monitor extremist movement in Afghanistan, it seems they now use Pakistan as a scapegoat for their own failures in the country. Uh, what's your view on that? I think it's a, it's a, it's really a, a very sort of narrowly construed uh, explanation. Um, I think there's a much. Uh, we need a three-dimensional perspective on this. I think Pakistan has been very much part of the situation in Afghanistan, at least since the Soviet, the war against the Soviets. We know that it's been a three-decade-long policy. Uh, but really, in terms of uh, why Pakistan is not being able to do enough, as we keep hearing from the U.S., I think there's a single. Uh, there's a single word there. I mean, Pakistan's India focus or India obsession, as some would say, is at the core of the problem. And unless that is addressed, and I think maybe the U.S. is not able to address that adequately, you can't really understand why Pakistan or the Pakistan army takes a str strange positions. I don't agree with Mr. Shahid Ali's very narrowly construed perspective, but I also don't agree with those uh, who want to say that Pakistan has this sort of inexplicable problem of terror and isn't doing anything about it and isn't that strange. But why isn't it doing something about it? Because it has a problem with India. Uh, and it does not want to be encircled by India on both sides. That's basic logic. We've known that forever. And if you cannot address it, uh, then I'm afraid we have to simply understand that there is a fundamental disagreement on what should be done in Afghanistan between Pakistan and the United States of America. Well, let's get a call in from uh, Dubai. Tawab has been waiting very uh, patiently as well. Dubai, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Uh, I, I appreciate the, uh, you and Al Jazeera, what you, uh, the news that you guys provide to everybody. Thank you. I've got two quick questions. One for your Pakistani guest, uh, Ms. Aisha Jalal and Mr. Sigal. Uh, the question is that given the dynamics of, of, uh, of current day Pakistan, it's being pressurized by Pakistan, by uh, the U.S., uh, given the U.S. policies, given the uh, Pakistani policies that has been ad adopted for the past few months, and given what the Taliban movement has resorted to, uh, where do we see this going in the long term, in let's say a few years? I, I, it okay. seems like it's actually the fire is uh, expanding as opposed to retracting. Right. And, and Tawab, what um, would be the second part, second question? The second question is uh, for your, um, uh, I believe her Did name is guess? Christina. Mm -hmm. Christine Fair, um, yeah. Uh, Christina, I'm an American citizen as well. I grew up in the U.S., and I've been watching the U.S. very carefully since September 11th. Everything gets published uh, published on the news. On a yearly basis, um, some 98,000 to 160,000 people die due to medical errors. Uh, Three to 4,000 people die every month because of drunk drivers, traffic accidents, uh, yet it's not sensationalized we don't focus on this stuff but the moment some slight news about terrorism hits the, okay. the news Tawab? all of a sudden we it gets the uh, mass the attention yeah. and all of our resources are focused on that okay thank you for that uh, just because uh, we're running out of time i want to get to major uh, ikram segal first and what what is the, what do you see the long-term uh, prognosis to, uh, uh, prognosis to be uh, major I think uh, if the uh, government of Pakistan can build on the successes of the Pakistan army on the ground and builds a counter-terrorism force, and that can be easily done. We have an anti-narcotic force. The anti-narcotic force is already on the ground for the last 20 years or so. It was uh, it is very well developed. It has done a terrific fight. It has brought uh, narcotics uh, smuggling and narcotics, I mean, poppy smuggling down to almost zero and narcotics smuggling down by about 100% down to about 10% what it used to be 20 years ago. 
I think if they build up something like that and they can, they can have uh, built up a counter-terrorism force around that, I think uh, the momentum, if they can keep it going, they can do that. But unfortunately, what we have is we have a totally, uh, um, uh, I mean, a person who's uh, completely without uh, the necessary, uh, uh, I would say, uh, background or okay. the security background as the interior minister. Um, and for some reason, uh, the government doesn't want to change him as long as he is there, uh, you know, okay, no counterterrorism force is going to go on the ground. Right, we've got and just uh, just that counterterrorism force goes on the ground, we are going yeah. to have nothing. Well, two minutes, less than two minutes left. So a minute for you, uh, Aisha Jalal, as well. Uh, an email question, if I may, came in from Amina Wasif, who wrote in via Facebook, saying, "Pakistan needs to be a secular state. This is the only way for it to survive." A quick thought on that, please. Uh, from me. Yes, please. Yeah. Hello. Yes, to you. I mean, I, I, I thought I, I was answering the earlier question, but you've now posed another one. Um, uh, I think that the question of secularism uh, is frequently misconstrued as implying anti-religion. Uh, I think Pakistan will always uh, have a concern with its religious identity. What Pakistan needs is a liberal, open society, which is accommodative of all its uh, citizens, ir irrespective of their religion. That, I think, is what Pakistan needs. But going back to the earlier question about the long-term prognosis, I think that the long-term prognosis is, for the world to hear, is that Pakistan is not collapsing. Okay. It is not going to be Talibanized. Pakistan is in a war, okay. uh, and there are certain things that is, are beyond its control. But what you need is a regional approach which accounts for Afghanistan's concerns, India's okay, concerns, Aisha? and Pakistan's to, to really move towards. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, I know the reason I have to stop because I have less than 30 seconds for uh, Christine Fair. Just to say, is, is the West isla islamicizing its problems here? Well, boy, I mean, that's a, that's a tough one. That's a big question for 30 seconds. I mean, it's, it's, a big, it, it's a big issue. The, the fact is that terrorism and militancy has gone in waves. You know, in the 80s, we had Sikh militancy. Uh, obviously, the LTTE was obviously a Tamil militancy. But this is a very particularly different issue because it's thoroughly global. It involves the movements of people, money, diasporas, individuals radicalizing country A, going okay. to country B, perpetrating actions in country C. And so I think so it's it, I, I think it's a it's fundamentally different challenge than previous challenges in the past. Well, I hope we get a chance to discuss more of it. Thank you very much for your time, all of you. Thanks for being with us, too. Remember, you can follow the program on Twitter. We'll keep you notified on shows, and you can send questions and comments for our guests there. On the next show, human rights in China. As the Chinese prepare to discuss their rights record in Washington this week, we look at how serious the Chinese government is about tackling issues involving ethnic minorities, internet freedom, and more. Be sure to tune in for that. For me and the team, we'll see you next time.